Chapter 8. Chapter 8. The bean diet ended on that day, but this blessed event did nothing to cool tempers in the combat zone. For the first time, the bosses of Interflux and Antiflux met face to face and joined battle. One might have thought that Simon was hopelessly outclassed in the argument, but he held his own, and whenever his father seemed to be getting the upper hand, his son, the son would always come back with, Why? Simon was finding that he was actually feeling better now that the whole thing was out in the open. Hardened by his night at Scuzz and educated by having seen Key C at work, he was not afraid to trade verbal blows with anybody, even Cyril Irving. The confrontation had three basic stages. First, the how could you do this to me, your own father stage, which was the most emotional and easily the loudest. In it, Mr. Irving was the dominant figure, issuing challenges designed to make Simon feel guilty. It was working beautifully, except that Simon was far too, too stubborn to allow his father to see that he felt like a worm. Then came the second stage, the theme of which was, give me back my land. Once again, Mr. Irving did most of the talking slash shouting. He doubled, tripled, and then quintupled the price of the land, but Simon explained that it belonged to the student council and was most emphatically not for sale, certainly not for warehouses full of zipper teeth. The students were not interested in profit, they were making a point. This led nicely into the third stage, which was a philosophical debate between the two fluxes, anti and inter. Here, Simon dominated the floor, waxing eloquent over the anti-flux point of view while his father sat in mute wonder. He tried turning the conversation back to stage one, where he had been in control, <coughs> but once Simon was started on the subject of interflux, nothing short of a movement of the earth could, all, could stop him. By this time, it was almost 7 a.m., and the war was called on account of sleep. Mr. Irving made it clear that it was only a ceasefire, and that Simon was by no means off the hook. Both father and son slept till half past one in the afternoon, and when they awoke, they found Ms. Irving already up and a large lunch awaiting for him. That was when the bean diet hit its official close. Mrs. Irving decided that if ever there was a moment to serve a meal unendorsed by the sun, this was it. She had prepared roast chicken, heaps of mashed potatoes, thick rich gravy, freshly baked bread, a chocolate layer cake that was nothing short of tremendous, and most important of all, nary a bean in sight. She hoped that full stomachs would help smooth over the animosity between her husband and son. It didn't work. As Simon was sitting down, his father announced, Oh, no, 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 you don't want to eat this food. Interflux paid for this food. Now you stop that, Cyril. The boy is hungry. He has the courage of his convictions. He'd be angry at us if we let him compromise his principles that way. Right, son? If you prefer, I'll go to Burger King and eat there, said Simon tersely. Well, there's just one problem with that, his father replied, you pay for your burger out of your allowance, which of course comes from me, making it dirty, tainted, filthy Interflux money extorted from the common people as Interflux ruthlessly mows them down in pursuit of corporate gold. Cyril, I insist you stop this! Well, if you want, said Simon, with a stubbornness that could have only been acquired through heredity, I'll take the money from my college account. Some of it, you may remember, was deposited before you started to work for Interflux. And how will you get to the bank and to Burger King, challenged his father. Certainly you can't take your car, as you'd probably realize by now the money to pay for it came from you-know-who. I'll walk, said Simon stoutly. I won't take my watch. I'll tell time by the sun. I'll well, only clothes that I got as presents from non-interflux people. And on my feet, I'll wear the bowling shoes that I won at Bowlerama for getting a strike when the lucky pin was out. If you want, I'll even muss up my hair so there'll be no trace of the last haircut that you and Interflux paid for. That sounds fine, son. 
but it just occurred to me that this house was paid for with money that at some point or another passed through the hands of Interflux. I'll stay with friends. Every night it's been done. Just when Mr. Irving was about to go after Simon with a chicken bone, Mrs. Irving jumped from her chair and announced, filled with more authority and volume than Simon and his father had ever heard from her, I've had enough! Father and son shared it, stared in shock. You're both acting like a couple of two-year-olds, and this is where it ends! I will not have this senseless fighting in my house! Now, I'm not going to say anything about your silly land, because it has no place in our home! What you're bickering about is business! She turned it to her office, to, to her husband. You keep it at the office, and to Simon, you keep it at school. You can be in the boardroom somewhere and slaughter one another, but in this house, you are father and son, and you love each other. Cyril, how dare you make your son feel guilty about living in his home? Simon, how dare you fight with your father, who's been nothing but good to you since before you were born? I have no authority at all over how you two conduct your lives from nine to five. When those hours are over, you are members of the army family, regardless of what has gone on during the day. That's it. The issue is absolutely closed. She sat back down and continued to eat her lunch quietly, as if nothing had happened. Simon and his father were so utterly cowed by this performance that they finished the meal in complete silence. The truce came over the cake. Son, said Mr. Irving, your mother is right. I apologize for bringing up a business matter at home, and I promise that at, it won't, at home it won't be mentioned again. Your father and son, and it's Saturday afternoon. Let's say we go down to the club and shoot some hoops. Right, Dad. And I apologize if I was in any way disrespectful, and I promise that at home I won't discuss these things either. And I think some basketball sounds like a good idea. Mrs. Irving beamed. But as soon as the two were out the door, Mr. Irving turned to his son. But you'd better know that as the head of Interflux, I intend to crush the life out of Antiflux, nail your carcasses to the wall, and put my zipper teeth wherever it suits me. And as the head of Antiflux, Simon said just as readily, it's my job to make sure you don't. But then the two shook hands in a peculiar gesture of agreeing to disagree. And strangely, despite all that had happened, Simon felt as close to his father as he'd ever been. Is it here? <laughs> so, I, so I already take it, Sam asked before class Monday morning. Well, let me put it this way, Simon replied. If my mother hadn't been there, he probably would have ripped my lungs out. But I think it's for all the best that it's finally out. What worries me is that in business, he's going to hit twice as hard now that he knows it's me. He said he intends to crush the life out of Antiflux. Do you think he'd go for a deal where we give him the land and he gives us the original $6,700, which we can give to Wendy to smooth everything over? Simon asked hope Sam asked hopefully. I wouldn't take it, said Simon. You offered me five times what we paid, and I still said no. Sam's face fell a mile and a half. Way to go, cheered Bill. Make him sweat. I can't believe this, Sam exploded. I jump into your mess, get involved, save your neck a couple of times, and this is how you reward me. We could be out of this hole, and you've dug it deeper. It's just like you told Wendy, said Simon righteously. If we took a poll of every kid in school, I think they'd vote to keep the land and fight. Auntie Flux is bigger than just the three of us now. But it's the three of us who are going to end up on the firing line. It's my father, said Simon. I'll take all the blame. No, you won't, said Bill dramatically. I'm with you all the way. When my friends are in trouble, I'm in trouble. I spent enough time in trouble for both myself and my friends. Sam sighed. The only difference between playing with my dog and hanging out with you guys is that my dog has a lot more common sense. All right, all right. If you guys want to go to war with pea shooters against ICBMs, I may as well stand with you at ground zero. I just want to lodge my formal protest right here and now. You already lodged your formal protest back on fence building day, Bill pointed out. That was for before, this is for now. If I'm going to end up charging into the thick of the battle under the banner of stupid, impulsive, harebrained ideas, I reserve the right to complain as much as I want. You guys are both nuts. 
I knew you'd come away around to our way of thinking, Phil said smugly. Hey, have any of you seen TC around? There's nobody at 0750. You can't be, you can't be thrown out of photography already, said Simon. The week hasn't even started yet. Now another tripod committed suicide at my house this weekend. Floyd said one more and I was on equipment probation. I need TC with me when I return the pieces. I think you're gonna have a lot of trouble getting him today, said Sam. The word is Nathan's in school. Nathan Krupman? Phil exclaimed with reverence. Here? Why is he shooting? No, he's meeting with some teachers to talk about his progress and things like that. You, you can't do everything by correspondence, you know. Also, he's got to work out a midterm exam schedule that won't interfere with Omni. Wow, let's go see him! Several hundred students turned out in the large school foyer to greet Nathan that day. When the director himself appeared, with TC a respectable half-step behind, the crowd broke into polite, admiring applause, and Nathan smiled and waved casually. He was a short young man, pleasantly homely, but there was an air about him that proclaimed almost infinite competence. He was the kind of guy Simon figured who, if he asked you to jump off a bridge, you'd do it, you'd do it without bothering to ask why, because Nathan must have a good reason. Simon frowned. What was the great one's good reason for opting not to cast Simon Irving in his extravaganza? Nathan agreed to say a few words. Hi guys, nice to be with you all again. See you on the set. Then TC announced, Nathan's really busy, everybody. We've got a lot of meetings to go to, so please give us some room. Instantly, the crowd melted away in front of Nassau Arts' most illustrious student, and he and his agent were off to their meetings. But not before TC had promised to find a few free minutes to attend the handing in of Phil's tripod fragment. Has anybody actually seen parts of this movie, Simon asked, as he, Sam, and Phil headed back to their lockers? Not even the teacher, said Sam. But what if it's lousy? Be real, will ya, said Phil. Nathan could never make a lousy movie. Nothing was accomplished in painting that day, as Emil Carada was plagued by self-doubt. This happens three or four times a year, Sam whispered as the artist stood in front of the class, bemoaning his meaningless life and making a terrible fuss. He talks about it in his book. I must have skimmed over that part, Simon responded. The one thing to remember is don't say anything. Even if he asks you a direct question, even if he screams in your face, keep quiet. What is the point in painting pictures for people to look at, Karada moaned. People are cretins. Cretins don't know good pictures from bad pictures. Miss Dixon, why are there so many cretins? Answer me! Laura just sat there tight-lipped. What if the cretins are right and I'm wrong? What if I paint terrible pictures? What if I, Karada, stink? Mr. Ashley, stink! Peter said nothing. The artist walked right up to Simon and looked straight into his face. Mr. Simon, do I stink? Pete, Simon sat like a statue, determined not to crack. No one will answer me! Why can I not get an answer for my own students, my twelve chosen? Someone will answer me! He rushed to the door, threw it open, reached a long arm out into the hall, and grabbed a student at random. When he pulled his hand back, he had Phil Baldwin by the collar. Hey, what's the big idea here? Oh, hi, Sotrius, Simon. You, impartial person! I want a simple, honest answer to a question. Does Canada stink? Phil looked shocked. Pardon? Do I stink? Oblivious to the frantic signaling from Simon and Sam, Phil looked Carada right in the eye and said, well, not especially, but if you don't mind my saying so, your cologne's a little tacky. Simon shut his eyes. Carada walked over to his desk, sat down heavily, and thumped his head down to the blotter in total dejection. Go away, he mumbled to Phil, the class, and quite possibly the whole world. Maybe tomorrow will be a better day. A new unforeseen force began to emerge at Nassau Arts. With Simon and Phil still on the cafeteria line, Sam sat down with his tray under the camel, and like a shot, Barbara was seated up opposite him. 
When Simon and Phil emerged from the line, they found a lively conversation in progress. Half the cafeteria was staring at Barbara, who was not only bubbling with chit-chat, but laughing, joking, and gesturing with her hands. Smiling absurdly at Sam, Simon and Phil left him to his fate and set him down at a nearby table where Bill McIntosh had a bet with Dino that he could see sink a half-eaten Nassau Arts rubber hamburger into a cafeteria garbage bin 45 feet away. The stakes? $100,000 cash! Where's Sam? asked Bill, sucking on a lifesaver. Phil tossed his head into the direction of the camel. The Red Baroness has him in her diabolical clutches. I see, said Bill knowingly. You finally got up the, up the courage to talk to her? No, Simon laughed. He sat down to wait for us, and by the time we got there, he was kidnapped. Later, when Sam discreetly reserved the use of the wreck for Friday night, Simon and Phil were on full ribbing alert. <laughs> Why? Have a couple of errands for your mom? Well, uh, not exactly. I know, said Sam. Charity work. Sam, you're a prince. Oh, get off my back, said Sam sheepishly. You know darn well I'm going out with Barbara. Phil pretended to look confused. Barbara? Barbara, Barbara. Oh, yes, Barbara. Red hair, IQ of a begonia. Cut it out, snapped Sam. Besides, she's not that stupid. Not stupid, repeated Phil. Barbara, give me a bait. Give me a break, Sotrius. Look, I'll admit that she's great looking and a really nice person, but don't you think you're overdoing it a little with not stupid? Sam made a face. She's just quiet, that's all. So are begonias. Leave him alone, said Simon. Sam was beginning to look dangerous. Meanwhile, things were rushed in biology class because Miss Glanfield was so often absent. But those mystical invisible bonds that exist between lab partners continued to strengthen with Simon and Johnny Zoll. Man, I knew Scuzz would be a real treat for you, but I never dreamed it would turn out so great. When I saw you standing up to start the fight, I got all choked up. It's great for a guy to see his lab partner supporting him like that. The group thought you were terrific. You were invited to all our gigs. Uh, thanks, Johnny Bean. So, what's the word? What's doing with Antiflux? Right now, nothing. Nothing, Johnny repeated. You sure that's wise? Well, it's not exactly nothing, Simon amended. You see, we have to wait to see what Interflux does next. I get it. We're going to force them to come at us and then hit them with a counterattack. Simon grinned weakly. Something like that. The next, move, the next move came on Tuesday, once again via the town. The Greenbush Weed Inspector had just so happened to pass by Lot 1346B, and there he saw tall ragweed, goldenrod, and dandelions. The owners were informed that they had 48 hours to cut down these noxious weeds or be subject to heavy fines. We can't afford heavy fines, Simon said positively. We can't even afford light fines. There are weeds all over town, protested Phil. Why are they picking on us? Interflux isn't interested in all over town, Simon said grimly. They just want to hassle us. If this is the biggest hassle they can come up with, said Phil, they're not going to last too long in the ring with Antiflux. Why, we could cut those weeds in three weeks, finished Sam, and we've got 48 hours, then heavy fines. Simon slapped his knee. The student council has only 26 bucks left, and Wendy would cut her own throat before giving us one cent of it. After all we've been through, I refuse to take the fall over something as stu stupid as a weed rap. Guys, I don't know what you're getting so upset about, said Phil. Antiflux is big time. We just call in our troops, and those weeds are history. Sam was skeptical. Oh, sure. 1,500 kids who hide all weekend just to get out of doing their own yard work are going to drop everything and volunteer to rid a whole land lot of weeds. What's your problem, Sam? Are you afraid to get a little dirt under the fingernails and ruin your good looks for the Red Baroness Friday night? I'll work just as hard as anyone else, Simon Sam said defensively, and I'll bet you the wreck's next tank of gas that 15 minutes into this operation I'm working and you're figuring out ways to slack off. Oh yeah? Yeah! 
Simon thought it over. Who in his right mind would volunteer to break his back cutting weeds? And then he had a vision of the fence building, and all those students who had greeted him in the hall introduced him to friends and congratulated him on antiflux. And Johnny Zalsworth often repeated, Hey man, if there's ever anything I can do... Still, weed cutting was never going to rank up high on anybody's list of favorite pastimes, so perhaps it would probably be a good idea to play up the spirit of Antiflux and de-emphasize the actual operation. Okay, he said to Phil and Sam, who were still bickering, I've got an idea. Antiflux, Program Board Emergency Meeting. Wednesday, October 24th, in the cafeteria at 3.30. New Antiflux program. Limited number of volunteers accepted. When, he, when people hear limited volunteers, they'll break their necks to get in, said Phil by way of self-congratulation. Right, Sam agreed. And when they hear weed cutting, they'll break our necks to get out. Keep it quiet until the meeting, said Simon. I intend to hit them with it in such a way that they won't mind. There was one problem, however, and that was equipment. A quick inventory of the school's gardening resources turned up three big scythes and 15 clippers and trimmers of various sizes that would not need electrical power. That was not nearly enough to equip the limited number of volunteers that, uh, the volunteers that Simon was hoping for. Between Simon, Phil, and Sam, they could collect only another nine or ten pieces so it was unanimously decided to ask a few closer friends to bring tools from home. The only problem with this was that as they canvassed, Simon was finding with increasingly alarm that weed cutting was even less popular than the program board had anticipated. Man, said Johnny Zoll in true pain, I'll help you with all out with this because you're my lab partner and all that, but let me tell you, it's gonna be just you and me out there because no offense, Weed cutting is the ultimate bad news. Phil McIntosh didn't react much better. There's only one thing I hate more than cutting weeds, and that's short people who try to get me to cut weeds. We could really use you out there, Phil wheedled. Oh, all right, but only if it's made absolutely clear that this isn't my idea of a good time. If it starts to get around that I like cutting weeds, I'm finished. Of the people in Karata's painting class, Sam selected Peter Ashley to recruit. Peter had a reputation for being game for anything, but even he balked when he heard the nature of the job at hand. This is your new program, Cutting Weeds? He shook his head. I don't get it. I happen to know there's going to be a very successful turnout tomorrow, said Sam. For Cutting Weeds? We'll see you there. Don't forget to bring all the cutters you can get together. In fact, the only people who didn't find the idea completely repulsive were Dino and Diana. The quarter-ton couple had no great love for gardening, but they were interested in supporting Antiflux, and nothing could be that bad if they could do it together. Also, Dino had a neighbor who was a professional gardener, so there was a good chance that he would be able to bring along a lot of equipment. On Wednesday afternoon, the cafeteria was jam-packed with students waiting to hear the next in installment of the Antiflux game plan. Phil was overjoyed with the turnout and was fighting Sam and was fighting with Sam over headcount estimates. But Simon was nervous. After all through dinner last night, his father had grinned maliciously at him, proving beyond a shadow of a doubt that Interflex had pulled the strings that had sent a town weed inspector to lot 1346B. Simon had looked back haughtily, although not a word was spoken by either of them, for fear of violating Mrs. Irving's household business ban. Simon's feelings now were that this just had to work, if for no other reason than to wipe that grin off of Cyril Irving's face. He glanced anxiously at the closed door to the school kitchen, behind which he knew Bill McIntosh stood guard over 150-odd pieces of cutting equipment. Then he gazed out over the crowd, easily 600 strong. Bleakly, he realized in a few short minutes, he would have to hit up this mob to engage in what might be, well, the least love activity of teenage life. He would have to get 
that equipment into those hands and then coax the whole lot out to 1346B. Impossible? Probably, but maybe Thor was right and someone up there in the Destiny Department really did have a soft spot for anti-flux. At the back of the assembly, Wendy stood behind Barbara, who was gazing up at the platform in unconcealed ador adoration. Wendy smiled. Keep looking, Barbara, because your little boy isn't going to be so pretty anymore when this afternoon is over. What are you talking about? I know the reason for this whole big meeting. Remember, all the anti-flux letters come to me first, so I happen to know that the sleaze bag, your Sam, and that jackass Phil Baldwin have dragged everyone in here thinking they're going to be consulted on something important. And you know what's really going to happen? Those three idiots are going to try and get the whole school out to their dumb land to cut down the weeds. The town says they have to. Barbara turned to pale. No telling how mad the kids will get, Wendy said cheerfully. <laughs> they might even storm the platform and slaughter the program board. Oh, look, the sleaze bag is standing up. I don't want to miss a word of this. Simon began by listing the sins of Interflux, past and present, and as always, it was a subject he could really warm to. In no time at all, he had the crowd eating out of his hand, but he knew he was a long way from home free. But now we have a new enemy. A political enemy. The town of Greenbush is Interflux's ally against us. The town runs the land office, and the land office is in a position to push us around. They're making it difficult for us to hang on to our lawful land, which is holding the Interflux expansion at bay. Are we going to stand for this? No! Chorus the crowd in, in one single powerful voice. You know, whispered Phil to Sam, this man might be president one day. It looks like he's going to pull this off. He hasn't mentioned weeds yet, said Sam mournfully. Then you'll see how fast the lynch mob forms. Are we going to sit back and watch while Interflux pulls the strings to hassle us? Simon was howling to the enraptured crowd. No! Are we going to lose our land to the town and Interflux on the basis of a few political technicalities? No! Are we going to give up our fight so easily? No! No, said Simon, shouting along with the crowd. Of course we won't. We're going to fight. Yeah! We're going to match Interflux technicality for technicality. Yeah! Triviality for triviality. Yeah! We're going to work to see that the town can't touch us. Yeah! And we're going to go out to our land and cut down all those weeds. Another yeah died in every throat. In its place, a strange murmur arose. A kind of hum tinged with confusion and vague discontent. All through the crowd, students talked to each other in whispers until someone finally piped, Hey, wait! What's this about weeds? The dirtiest of dirty tricks, Simon pronounced darkly. Interflux sent a town weed inspector to our lot, and if the weeds aren't cut by tomorrow, we'll be hit with fines so heavy we'll lose our land. A nervous buzz passed back and forth through the crowd until finally Dave Roper, who had spearheaded the work crew on fence building day, shouted, Well, cut the weeds! Nah, came the voices of several hundred people in the seconds that followed. Others still muttered, No way! Forget it! Calm yourself! And I still don't understand what's going on here! Interflux thinks that Nassau Artists doesn't have the dedication to do what's necessary, Simon shouted. They think they can beat us on our own laziness. They've got another thing coming, howled someone. Yeah, cut those weeds, bellowed Dave Roper. There was a weak yeah, but the spirit was growing. Phil was with Simon on the edge of the platform, coaxing that syllable out of reluctant throats. Even Sam was on his feet, bowled over by the realization that Antiflux was going to keep its land, even if it had to, God forbid, cut weeds. At that opportune moment, Bill McIntosh opened the door to the kitchen and watched in fascination as the students lined up to equip themselves. On the podium, Phil slapped Simon on the back hard enough to dislocate both shoulders. Your mouth! I'm gonna have it bronzed! That's my lab partner, shouted Johnny Zoll to anyone who would listen. Unbelievable, muttered Wendy, shaking her head. He did it, that sleaze bag.
Inside the boundaries of the makeshift anti-flux fence lived a formidable expanse of weeds. To this spot, to this spot marched the grim reapers of anti-flux, a gloomy but determined lot accepting this responsibility as they accepted exams, nuclear proliferation, pestilence, and rained out Mets games. The procession halted at the fence, and the students gazed in quiet resignation at the noxious flora laid out before them. Oh, wow, Phil said bleakly. You could hide a rhinoceros in there. Man, echoed Gino, you could hide me in there. The crew set to work after Dave Rover finally consented to the removal of a section of the fence for purposes of a gate. His distress was so genuine, his protestations so loud, and his love for the fence so comical that the entire work crew indulged in a good laugh at Dave's expense and started this distasteful job in a better frame of mind for it. The lightheartedness soon grew, as students realized that working side by side with friends and colleagues against a common enemy could be an uplifting experience. Making the job even more tolerable was the fact that there were several times as many volunteers as there were pieces of equipment, so the work was done in very short shifts, and those students not working cheered and heckled those who were. About a half hour into the job, a full-fledged carnival atmosphere was in effect, and the dreaded weed-cutting expedition was turning into the social event of the season. Although it was obvious that there was far more goofing off than real work going on, Simon was delighted. Not only would the job get done, but the program board would emerge with its image higher than ever. He also took great satisfaction in the fact that he and his weeds had achieved exactly what Wendy had expected to get out of it. Start over. He also took great satisfaction in the fact that he and his weeds had achieved exactly what Wendy had expected to get out of countless parties and social activities. Dare he hope that she would see this too and forgive him? He asked of a three-foot golden rod. Even it didn't think so. With a single swing of his big scythe, he killed the offending weed and its whole family. Even greater mirth was provided when Ms. Blandfield arrived on the scene, eager to strike a blow for freedom by lending her lawnmower to the cause. She roared into the fray, but soon her gas-powered mower was hopelessly jammed by long grasses and tough stems. There was a small explosion, which threw Miss Glanfield into the startled arms of Johnny Zoll. Unhurt, she withdrew, pulling the remains of her mower behind her. This, she announced to the convulsed crowd, was sabotaged by Interflux, which had traced her phone calls and was after her, just as, just as it had arranged for her septic tank to malfunction yesterday. By this time, there was as much play going on as work. It was not known who started the weed war, but by the time the entire land lot had been cut down to a height of three inches, about 6.30 p.m., there were more than 50 soldiers involved. Cut weeds were flying in all directions, and students were skulking around planning high strategy. When Simon announced it was time to go home, there were genuine cries of protest. It was after 7 p.m. when Simon arrived home. You're filthy, his mother exclaimed in horror. You're all covered with dirt and grass, and there are stains all over your clothes, and you've got goldenrod in your hair. What have you been doing? Simon looked past his mother to where his father sat peering sharply over the top of the evening paper. Everyone else in school looks like this too, Mom. We had something important to do, he added meaningfully, and we did it. Mr. Irving's eyes disappeared behind the paper once more, but Simon was sure his father wasn't smiling. So he smiled instead.